First of all, th thanks to, to, to Don and, uh, for, for putting all this together. It's, it's really wonderful um, to be part of this, and it's very exciting. Uh, I'm going to talk about a, a joint project with, with two students at Stanford, Thomas Rodriguez Barraker and, and Xu Tan. And we're talking, uh, we're, we're looking at network patterns of favor exchange. And uh, I'll, I'll start out with just putting this in some basic broad context. Uh, some of this will, you know, some statements that are fairly obvious, but I think important for, to emphasize that, you know, cooperation is fundamental to our day-to-day -day existence and, as, as human beings. And in particular, um, there's a lot of, interactions which aren't contractable and need to be self-enforcing. And self-enforcing means that people have to have incentives to actually do things which sometimes aren't in their personal interests in the short run, but are, are beneficial to society and so forth. So cooperating with other individuals. And uh, for a variety of reasons, we don't contract on everything. If somebody comes in and asks me to, to give a lecture for them uh, because they, they can't make it, um, I don't ask them to write out a, a check to me um, or, you know, to sign a contract. Uh, we, you know, there's some idea that, that, that in, the, in the future they'll reciprocate or, or that they're being good, you know, that, 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 that I'm being a good citizen and that that um, counts for something. So the, the, the basic topic here is trying to understand how favor exchange depends on and influences <laughs> social structure. So there's going to be a symbiosis between how people are organized in terms of who they communicate with, who they interact with, and what goes on in terms of favor exchange. And that's what we want to explore. Um, so in terms of, of behavior and networks, one thing we'll be emphasizing here is sort of quote determination, a, 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 a top po uh, popular term in these days in the network science literature is coevolution. But basically the idea that, that social structure is influencing the behavior here. So what favors I'm able to call on people for is going to depend on who my friends are and, and how we're connected. But also that the social structure is going to be partly determined by the, the provision of the favors. So we can't really look at these things as separate. We want to look at them and try and understand them together. OK. Um, well, just in terms of background, there's a, a literature on social capital which has a lot to say about this topic. And in particular, I'll sort of emphasize James Coleman's work, but you know, you see the same kinds of ideas floating around in, in Bourdieu, Putnam, and a whole series of others. And in, in terms of the impact in, in networks, a lot of the takeaway from what Coleman talks about is interpreted in, in terms of, of network closure. Um, and it's also been measured in terms of transitivity and clustering measures. And the idea is that uh, you know, if I'm looking at a given individual and they're uh, connected to other individuals, then the fact that if I'm, you know, person I, uh, I'm connected, I have friendships with, with J and K, then J and K, by communicating, can help keep track of how well I'm doing and can help enforce behavior by collectively sanctioning me if I'm, if I'm not behaving. Okay, so that's sort of the basic idea. And here I just pulled uh, a, a diagram out of, of uh, Coleman's 88 paper on, on closure, where here he's emphasizing the fact that if you look at person A and you're trying to enforce their behavior, the fact that in this situation B and C know each other um, helps uh, enforce behavior on A. Okay, so you know here a quote from Coleman is in a structure with closure like that of Figure 1B, B and C can combine to provide a collective sanction, and that extra emphasis helps you know uh, provide incentives for person A to behave well in a, in a given society. Okay, so when you look at, at social networks, one thing that's been made a lot of in, in the, the past few decades is that there's high clustering coefficients, high levels of transitivity, and this high levels of local closure and triadic closure. And so when you look across different data sets, um, one way to get an idea of the, the magnitude of these kinds of things is to compare what you actually see in a given network to what would occur if the links were put down completely at random. So take the same number of nodes, take the same number of links, put them down at random, ask how much, what would the triadic closure be, look at what you've actually got, and see whether it's higher than, than what you'd see at random. So if you do that for, you know, there's a, a nice data set from McCray on prison friendships, 31% uh, of, of people's 
friends are friends with each other. Um, you would get about 1.3% 1, 1 if you did that in the same number of nodes or the same number of links if you, if you put the links down at random. Um, Co-authorship networks, there's a series of studies, you know, depending on the particular area, uh, this kind of, of clustering varies between 10 and 20%. Um, when you look at these, these are much larger networks than the, the McRae. There you're getting numbers uh, in terms of, of random, you know, the, you, you would never see triadic closure. So you're seeing something, there's certainly something there uh, that's important. Um, another one that I'll talk about in a little more depth today is Florentine marriages and business dealings. Let me just show you this one. This is uh, data that was originally collected by Kent and then refined by, uh, discussed in detail by Paget and Ansel. Um, and these are families in, in 15th century Florence, so around 1430. And here, there's a link between two families in this particular graph. If either they had a recorded business dealing with each other or a marriage between the families, between members of the families. Okay? So here, there's, there's a link. I've, I've put in both of these two different types of relationships into one graph, and I'll tell you about why later. Uh, but the idea here is that random, this is a much smaller network. Uh, you, would, you would get 29% of the time that you had uh, some family dealing with two other families. Would you actually have a relationship between them? And the clustering here is, is about 0.46. Okay. Okay. So what's the, the, the point here? Um, part of the point that, that uh, we want to get to is here, what I want to do is actually model social pressure explicitly. So we're going to be working with game theoretic tools of, of favor exchange and modeling this, this process explicitly. And then the question will be, what do we come out with? Do we come out with this kind of measure, which Coleman is suggesting is important and we're seeing in the data, or do we come out with something else? Okay. And the answer is, we're going to come out with something else. So what we're going to do in this paper is, first of all, we're going to look at, at favor exchange. We're going to take a game theoretic perspective on it. So people are going to we're going to look at costs and benefits for doing favors and keeping friendships. We'll look at what the enforcement mechanisms are and then ask which kinds of networks will be sustainable in, in a, a self-enforcing way. So we'll look at those networks. We're going to look for robust networks. So we're going to look for ones that aren't too fragile in a very well-defined sense. And then um, that's going to predict a measure that's going to be different from what, what the clustering measure is that we've talked about. And then we're going to go to data from, we have data on 75 different villages in rural India. Uh, and we have favor exchange in those villages. We have networks of favor exchange. And we'll actually look at what the patterns look, look like and see what the, what the theory says and, and whether or not that seems to appear in the data. Okay. So that's the structure of what, what I want to do. And, and one thing I think that is good in terms of this conference, especially since people have very different backgrounds and, and different perspectives, is to just jump in anytime anything's unclear, ask questions, and, and I'm happy to just have the dialogue go along as, as we, I mean, if, if that's okay in terms of a, of a I prefer that. yeah, so, so, so please feel free to interrupt me anytime you have questions, uh, you know, technical details or um, big picture, whatever, whatever questions you have. Okay. So we'll have a finite set of people, and I'm going to call them agents, as, as economists often refer to them. Um, so these are, are going to be individual villagers in the, in the towns we'll be looking at, and they'll be borrowing and lending kerosene, rice, small amounts of money with each other. Uh, there are going to be time periods, so we're just going to make this a nice discrete time period. So over time, I might need a favor some days and not other days. Um, there might be some, it could be, you know, weeks, years, et, et cetera, but we'll, we'll have discrete time periods. Um, and the important thing is here, a link is going to represent a relationship between two individuals where they can do favors for each other. So people that I know well enough to ask a favor of or that I can do a favor for, that's going to be represented by a link in a network. Okay. And the, the need for favors are going to come randomly over time. So sometimes I need a favor, sometimes I need somebody to do a lecture for me, I need some money, et cetera, and I can go and ask people that I know that I'm linked to for, for those favors. Okay, now I'm gonna start with a very simple version of the model where, where everything is completely symmetric, 
And then in order to get to the data, we're going to have to enrich the model. But I want to give you just the ideas very simply. And I'll, I'll spend a little time just on the, the basic structure of how we work with things. And then I'll tell you about the heterogeneity at the end. So for the simplest version, we're going to think of very, you know, here people are borrowing and lending kerosene in some of these villages. So there's a value to, to getting some kerosene if you don't have it. Um, you, know, you, you need to cook, you need some heat. Uh, so, so you'll get um, a value from that. There's a cost of giving some kerosene to somebody else. Um, and the important thing is that the, it's going to be situations where it's socially valuable to do the favors. So the value of, the, of the, you know, getting the kerosene for a given person is, is more than the cost for the other person to lend it for a short period of time. Okay. So value of a favor exceeds the cost. And people are going to have, we'll have a discount factor. And people won't view the future as the same value of today. So we'll, we'll, we can talk about what's the value of having a friendship over time where we're exchanging favors. Okay? And the important thing is that favors are going to come probabilistically. So at some random rate of arrival, a probability uh, P describes the chance that in a given period I'm going to need a favor from another individual. Okay? So let's just think about what happens in a favor exchange. What, why would we exchange favors? What's the, the value to me of, of being in a relationship? So in a given period, um, there's some probability P I'm going to need a favor. If that happens, then I get a value V. There's some probability that I'm going to have to be the person giving a favor and lose a cost C. So the value for me in the expectation of a given period is just P times V minus C. Right? So it's very easy calculation of what the value in a one period um, if we're going to exchange favors and I trust this person to exchange favors if, if we need to in a given period. Okay? Are you yeah. going to be assuming that, that within a given period that, that uh, you know, we're assuming that favors are higher likely events or are we going to assume that favors are rare events? We're going to think of these as very rare so, so um, we want to think of this as the way we'll actually do it is almost like a continuous time version where the period, think of periods as being very short and so um, they'll arrive. Uh, you could do this in continuous time and just have a Poisson arrival We're process. You're not, not going to have multiple favors. Exactly. So, yeah. so yeah. it'll be our life will be a lot simpler if we don't both need to do favors for each other. <laughs> you, can imagine um, you can imagine the other regime as well, where over the well a time period you're going to have lots and lots of favors. Everything will approach to me. But yes. that's what I wanted to know. Exactly, exactly. So we're going to simplify things dramatically by just assuming one, at most one in a period. And, and so we're thinking of periods as the limit of a, a Poisson product. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Well, I understand you have the same probability of D for all pairs, D and P. Right. So for the, for, the, for the version I want to explain right now, just to keep things simple, that's true. But more generally, um, what, when I talk about the, the, the results, the probability can be dependent on how many friends I have, who the friends are, and so forth. So, for instance, if I need a lecture, to, you know, somebody to, to guest lecture for me when I'm, I, I have to go somewhere for some emergency, then there could be some number of, you know, depending on how many people I have that could substitute, that's going to affect the probabilities that I ask different people. And so here, in this version, we're going to just think of this P as a fixed thing that's independent of the network and so forth. But more generally, you can think of it as depending on the network, depending on the individuals, what kind of favor it is, and so forth. And I'll talk about that in, in a few minutes. Okay, so we have this expect, expected value per period. Um, the value of a perpetual relationship is now just you know, a sum of these. So I have this today, uh, same value tomorrow, same value, you know, and so forth. So we just take a, a sum of this discounted by the discount factor over time. So it's just a sum of a series. And now we get that the value with this discount factor V is P times V minus C over 1 minus delta. Okay, so this is just in perpetuity, if two people are doing favors for each other, what's the value of a relationship? And this is going to be an important number that we need to keep track of. Okay, so we've got that. Now, when can two people, let's think of just two people without any outside world existing, how could they perpetually exchange favors? They're going to be able to perpetually exchange favors if when I'm asked to give a favor to somebody, it's going to incur a cost C for me today. It has to be that the value of the relationship in the future is at least as high as giving the cost. Otherwise, you know, it's better for me just to dissolve the relationship than actually, you know, somebody comes to ask 
you know, that I, they, they need $10,000 in a short-term loan, I might begin to think, well, you know, do I really need this relationship? So the, the value of the favor has to be less than the, the cost of the favor has to be less than the perpetual value of the, of the friendship. Okay. So that's the, for, for maintaining just an isolation favor exchange. And so, you know, the obvious kinds of things is if, uh, if things become very probable, so it's very likely we, we interact a lot, there's a lot of chances for favors in the future, that makes it easier to sustain favor exchange. Um, as a discount, as we become more and more patient, that makes it easier to exchange favors and so forth. But in cases where we don't interact so much, it's going to be harder. Just one more clarification. Um, so when you're saying you enter into this, this exchange relationship, I mean, you initially sort of said it's an opportunity to exchange favors, but it sounds like it's actually a credible commitment to exchange favors over the next time step. Is that, is that correct? Right. So what we're going to do now is, is, is this is just sort of a, an idea of, of the basic payoffs. And now we want to ask, what are the incentives? And when will this actually be sustainable? So we're going to look at a, a game theoretic analysis of, of, of doing this. I'm just trying to figure out the meaning, the meaning of the edge, though. Because you imagine a situation where you know, we, if we have an edge, it means that it's possible for us to exchange favors, but then we could make a decision not to, uh, right. which is why I first thought you were saying. But it sounds like what, you're, what the meaning of an edge here is we commit for the next time step credibly that like, if, so, if you need something, I will give it to you. Right. And so I can't change it until the time step after that. Sure. Exactly. So I'm going to be much more explicit about it, okay. precisely that question in just a second. But that, that, that's exactly the way you want to interpret it is edges are going to represent that we are exchanging favors. And if any time I fail to do something, then the edge is going to be broken. Uh, and, th and that's precisely the way to interpret edges. Yes, exactly. Aren't you bearing the cost here into the indefinite future? Um, so, so, right, so, so there's the one part which is let's suppose that, for, today. Yeah, that, that today you happen to ask me for a favor. So then I have a given cost that I have to pay right now, yeah. and that's just an instantaneous cost of this particular favor. Right. And then there's future costs, which I might have to pay in, in perpetuity, and those are captured over on this side. No, that's right. That's what I mean. But yeah. it's not just the next step. You're paying that cost forever. Well, this cost I just pay once. That cost you just pay once, but the one over there, you said... I'm paying that an expectation because I realize if you're my friend, you know, every once in a while you're going to ask me for favors and I'm going to have to pay those, but you'll also be giving me favors and, and it's the V minus C. We're exchanging favors at, a, at, a, at an expectedly even rate in this case. So I've got, I've got both expected costs and expected benefits in the future. That's what this is representing. And, and what I'm paying right now is I'm asked to suddenly do a favor for somebody, and at that moment I'm asking myself, do I want to follow through and do this, or am I willing to break the relationship? And, and so the perpetuity, so the, the, this is just an instantaneous cost, and then there's a, a per, perpetual value if we maintain the relationship, and if I expect it to maintain, be maintained, then, then, then there's a, a value and cost associated with those, which are both appearing here. Okay. So, so the idea now of bringing networks into things, and, and let's suppose we just look at a triad. So we've got three individuals, and they're all exchanging favors with each other. Okay. Well, um, before we had this expression that, that in order for a person to, to provide a favor, the cost had to be less than the value of a relationship. Let's suppose that we have a triad, and we follow the following rule. What we do is, is, if anybody doesn't ever perform a favor when they're asked to, we ostracize that particular agent. Right? So, so that person is asked to do a favor, and the person doesn't perform, then both of the, the other people no longer interact with that individual. <coughs> right? So the idea here is, is that if two doesn't do a favor for one, then they're not only going to lose the friendship with one, they're going to lose the friendship with three as well. So they're going to lose two potential friendships. And what that does is it changes the incentive constraint. So the incentive constraint before was just that the cost had to be less than the value, a perpetual value of a relationship. Now, if I don't do a favor, I can be penalized by losing two relationships instead of just one relationship. So it's an easier constraint to satisfy. I'm going to be more willing to do favors if there's more people that I might lose as friends as a result of not doing a single favor. Right? So if, if I don't do a, if I don't, somebody asked me to, to, to lecture for them, and I don't do it, then they say, well, Matt's not a good guy, he didn't do that favor, let's not trust Matt anymore, and, and I'm excluded from the group, then that's a more powerful punishment than just losing that particular relationship. Right? So, so the idea here is that this makes it much easier to sustain relationships. That's assuming the third party has this strategy. 
Right, right, exactly. You so we're going to have to think very carefully about what, you know, what, what people's incentives are and why they would want to do that, and is it in their interest to break that relationship and so forth, precisely. And I mean, you're also, it seems like to, to get some of these results, I think, you know, this assumption of indefinite future, it seems like there are some uh, hidden assumptions about homogeneity that have to be made for that, like temporally, for instance. Because otherwise, it's not, I mean, I would imagine you get, the, you get to say that uh, my choice is either break it now and forever or hold it forever because of the assumption that if I was ever going to break it, then I would break it now and it would never be credible. But that credibility argument, right, has some hidden induction elements in it. Right, right. There's, there's, a, there's an induction, of basically yeah, a stationarity some, assumption in this. Yeah, there's some. Okay. Um, so and and right. sort of, we, we sort of think of the world as it, that it's going gonna, it's gonna to start tomorrow just as it did today, and then uh, the, the values will be stationary over the future. And there could be period, you know, if it's not, in, with, with values that vary over time, this becomes more complicated, and I can say a little more about that later on. Well, this assumes the other person is going to make the same decision. If you, if you make this decision, depending on the other person staying in the association. Right, so so far I haven't really gotten into the game theory much. I'm just sort of giving you the basic payoff structure and, and what the possibilities are. And now we can go through exactly that kind of reasoning. Is it in that person's interest to actually follow through with the punishment? When will it be? When won't it be? And, and those kinds of questions. Exactly. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do a, a few minutes of, to give you a, a flavor of what the game theory is and how it works. I, I, I realize that most people, a number of people here won't be familiar with the game theoretic details, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I want to give you a flavor for how this works because it's sort of uh, an important part of the paper. And then I'll give you an idea of what the main things that come out of this analysis are and then see how it look, what, what it looks like in the data. Okay, so the, the game is very simple. People can, can either choose to maintain or, or get rid of a relationship. So if, I, if at some point I decide not to do a favor, I'm basically uh, severing a tie with somebody. Um, keeping a relationship means doing favors when called upon. And one thing that's going to be very important for what we do is it's, going to, uh, we're, we're, it's not going to be easy to sort of replace people. So if I break a friendship with somebody, I can't turn around and instantly form a new friendship with somebody else. So we're going we're gonna to make it that you can't add new links if you, you if I, I can't just replace people. But effectively what's important is that at least it takes some delay. I, I can't instantly replace friends that, that, I'm, that I'm getting rid of. Okay, and that, that's going to be important in what we do. Okay, so what's going to happen is in some time period somebody's called upon to do a favor for somebody else. Um, the probability is small, so there might be some periods where nobody's called on to do a favor, but we're going to abstract away from the possibility that two favors come in the same period. Then that person has a choice. They either maintain the link, do the favor, or they can choose not to do the favor and get rid of that tie. So if, I, if I'm called on to do a favor for somebody and I don't, then I'm, I'm basically deciding to sever that relationship. And then other people can respond. So we're going to allow other people to respond. Anybody can announce which things they want to maintain. So other people can decide to sever a relationship with me, too, if I don't perform well. And then the links that are retained are the ones where both people in the relationship are willing to maintain it and keep doing it to the next period. Okay? So that's the structure of the game. Very simple. In any period, somebody might be called on to do a favor. They decide yes or no. They do it or not. If they don't, the, le the relationship disappears. Other people can respond to that if they want. Um, they can maintain the relationships or not. And, and you mean just relationships with the person who's been asked to do the favor? Um, um, they can, they can maintain it. They could sever other ones as well. So it's a full, they have full freedom. Uh, at any point in time, I can sever any relationships I want in response. Um, how, how do you start? Um, the right. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to look for configurations of networks that if they are in place, they will stay in place. But we're not going to start with some initial condition and then, and so we'll just start with a network and ask the question, when is it that this network would survive over time? If we started at that, would everybody be willing to maintain their favors and do, do what? So we're just going to look at an equilibrium definition of, of a network in this context. Okay, so one point to just to to start with, um, let's let M be the minimal, so I've got a cost of providing a favor today. 
let's look at m to be the minimal number of relationships you have to threaten me with losing in order to make sure that I'm willing to perform a favor. Okay? So m is just how many people have to be willing to, to sever ties with me in order to make sure that I want to do a favor when I'm called upon. So generally, the interesting question here is going to be when this number is bigger than 1. If it's only 1, then everybody could just sustain favors in perpetuity and as pairs, and there's no reason for networks. So the social sanction comes in when, in order to get people to behave themselves, we have to have some possibility of social uh, reactions, and M is rep representing how many people have to, to, to come at a person in order to make sure that they behave. Okay, so there's lots of equilibria in this game. Basically, the following is an equilibrium. Look at any network where everybody has at least M, M relationships and follow a very draconian rule, where, where the rule is if anybody ever fails to do a favor, then we all stop doing favors for everybody in perpetuity. Okay? So just a, a complete what's called grim trigger in the game theory literature. We, we blow up the world if anybody ever misbehaves. Okay? That works, right? Everybody has an incentive. I, I perform well because I realize if I ever fail to perform, then, then the whole world, the society is going to collapse and, and we'll never do favors for each other again. Um, that, that works as an equilibrium. And the difficulty is that this gives us no predictive power in terms of social structure, right? Basically, anything, any network where everybody has at least M ties is sustainable as, as an equilibrium, okay? So, so that's a, a little bit of a problem. And also, the, one difficulty with this is we don't think the world operates this way. Right? It's, it's not as if, if, if somebody doesn't behave well that everybody stops cooperating. Um, we selectively sanction that individual. So what we want to do is, is sort of get away from these equilibria that are too fragile and costly. And we're going to look for two properties. We're going to look for, for networks that have two different properties. One is that there's minimal punishments, or in some sense, credible punishments. So we don't blow up the whole world if somebody doesn't behave. Um, agents shouldn't find some other possible continuation instead of blowing up the world to be better for everybody involved than what the, actually what they're doing. Okay? So we shouldn't be able to find some other continuation. We should do the minimal amount in terms of punishments. We don't have to stop everything. We, just stop, we have to punish that person at least M links, but not more than that. And the other thing is robustness. So when we think about who ends up suffering because of a particular person's actions, we could have that either be localized so that person's friends are doing the punishments, or we could have it spread and, and, and spread to larger parts of the network. Okay. And the idea is we want minimal spread of, of contagion. So we don't want this to, to, to spread through the whole network. Okay. So, so two conditions we're going to look for is, is networks you can sustain, but ones that don't have incredible punishments and ones that are robust, and so there's a minimal spread of the, of the, the, the after effects of somebody not performing a favor. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just going to go through some sort of pictures and sort of give you an idea of how this works and then uh, what, what the results are. Um, so here, what we're going to assume is that, in, in, for the small villages, I think it's reasonable. Uh, we're going to assume that gossip is fairly fast. So if somebody doesn't perform something, everybody hears about it. Um, what's going to turn out is the networks that have these properties are going to be such that the only people who ever have to react are going to be directly involved in the relationships that are there. So, so you won't, it, we'll get out as a byproduct of this that you won't have to have an assumption like that. But for now, just think of it as a small village where gossip is very useful and, and uh, if somebody doesn't do something, then other people hear about it quickly. Matt, can, can you clarify, when, when, when the random god chooses you and you need a favor in, in a given period, you only need a favor from one, one person, right? Right. You only have more than one link because of the enhanced punishment that comes with you. You only want more than one link because that allows you to enforce other people to give you favors, not because you're going to get more favors, right? Um, right, so actually the, the way that this is working so far is that, that the, the um, if I have two links, then I, I have the possibility of being asked for twice as many favors and getting twice okay, as many right. favors. 
So favors actually come with links, not with an individual. Um, the more general version of the paper, it, it, you just have some sort of property that, that depending on the graph structure, I'm going to have some opportunities that will arise. But right now, think of, think of favors as coming, you know, if we have a friendship, then there's a possibility for us to do favors for each other in a given period. And that's independent of what other relationships I have. But those other ones are going to be important in making sure that, that you and I do favors for each other. Yeah. Okay, so let's just look at how this works in terms of, of two individuals. Um, or, sorry, when n is equal to two with four individuals. So let's suppose, and this is the idea of the minimal punishment, so we're not sort of blowing up the world here. Um, if m equals two, so I need, I have to be threatened with two punishments in order to make sure that I perform, then if one doesn't do a favor for two, what's going to happen? So one doesn't do a favor for two. So there, that, that relationship disappears. And now we sort of think of what the aftermath of that is. Well, once one hasn't do, done a favor for two, then when four and one are looking at their relationship in the future, four looks at one and thinks, I can no longer trust one. I can't trust one because one doesn't have any other friends now. And so the next time I need a favor from one, one's not going to do it for me because they only can lose one relationship. Right? So, so in some sense, somebody that only has one friendship left is no longer trustworthy. And so both one and two become, they're, they're, you, you, you can't trust them any longer. So four is never going to do favors for one and three shouldn't do favors for two either. So once these people become isolated, they become, they're no longer trustworthy, and that means that necessarily the network is going to have to, you know, those links are no longer going to function, and then of course this one's not going to function anymore. So this is a sort of situation where we have this minimal structure, and once you break a piece of it, it's going to collapse down. Uh -oh. So once one fails to do the favor for two, shouldn't two say, I forgive you and keep the link because otherwise he's going to lose cooperation? Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. right. So, so one difficulty here is that once we realize this, then, then, uh, you know, then the person wants to say, well, I forgive you for not doing the favor. The difficulty is once you do that forgiving, well, then, I can, then, I, then you know that, that I'm going to forgive you and that doesn't work. So actually what we do in the paper is actually carefully go through what we call renegotiation proof equilibria, which is a special kind of equilibria that deals exactly with that. So there's a game theoretic concept which deals with that, and that's what we characterize in terms of the, of the, of the, the equilibria of this, of this game. But it, it, in fact, if you, it, once you go through that argument, then you know, it, it has to be that this thing's going to fail. Um, okay. So basically what, what happens is, is you know, this kind of structure can sustain itself. Um, and and it's, it, it sustains itself because it really has this critical kind of structure to it. But now let me, let me I'm gonna go ahead a little bit here. So here's two different critical structures. Okay? Here's the society. Both societies have seven people in them. One, and, and we're both, let's think of both of these situations where I need two different relationships, I fear losing two relationships in order to keep me honest. In this picture, basically this one works the same way the one I just talked about with four individuals works, right? I, I pull one of these links out, then these two people are no longer trustworthy, everything's going to cascade down, and this thing's going to fail. Um, this one also has the property that we can sustain it as an equilibrium, but now it's more compartmentalized. Right? So in this situation, if, if this person doesn't do a favor for this person, this relationship's going to disappear. Well, this person's now isolated. This is going to collapse down. But it doesn't have any contagion to the rest of the network. So if you want to avoid this larger contagion, you, you have to build the network by piecing together these minimal cliques. Right? So you put cliques together in a special way. And if you put cliques together in a special way, you can still have this enforcement but you don't have problems of when somebody doesn't perform a favor, you end up having a cascading problem where it infects the whole network. Okay. Yeah. Once that upper triangle is baked here in terms of links, doesn't the uh, node in between the next triangle also get what, by the partner? Right, so what happens here is now this person still has two relationships. Oh, two. So they're still, they're still trustworthy, okay. yeah. right? So, so that's why you can piece these things together in this way and it actually works. 
Um, you have to be very careful, it turns out, on how you piece them together. And, and there's a the characterization that, that we go through. But basically, in terms of one way to build these sort of robust networks is what you do is you paste together these minimal self-sustaining networks, these, these little cliques, okay? But you need to do so in a way that doesn't sort of admit contagion, right? So you, you, you put them together very carefully, um, and you know, you, you could, for M equals two, you could put together however many cliques of three you wanted. What's important is you actually don't introduce larger cycles. So you can't come back, and if you introduce a larger cycle, then you still have this problem that you can have these kinds of contagion effects. But as long as you do so, so you don't introduce larger cycles, everything's fine. Okay? Um, if you had M equals three instead, you would have to piece together cliques that were more intricately related, right? So you, you have cliques now that have three relationships between each individual. So we call these quilts, social quilts. Um, so these are unions of minimal cliques, completely connected subnetworks of M plus one nodes, such that the largest simple cycle has no more than M plus one nodes. So you just piece these things together. That's the definition, uh, graph theoretic definition of a quilt. And then the, the first result in terms of equilibrium is that if you sustain a network of favor exchange and it's robust against its contagion, then that's gonna be true if and only if it's one of these shapes. So the, the full characterization of the set of equilibrium networks that don't have larger contagion are exactly the set of these pasted together cliques of individuals where everything is exactly self-sustaining without any more links and making sure that uh, you know, you've pasted these things together that you didn't introduce any other cycles. Okay, so any questions to there? Um, do you yeah. think these 15th century guys understood that they better not form a cycle? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so actually, um, so the, the forming of cycles is a, is a separate issue, but, the, uh, but the, I'll come back to that because Cosimo is ex very explicit in terms of the relationships that they were building and making sure that if you wanted to maintain a business relationship that you had third parties that were involved and so you formed these small cliques. And I'll come back to that particular example because it, it's a very illuminating example in terms of, of exactly what was going on here. Okay, so, so, so far there were lots of sustainable networks, as, but instead if we sort of minimize the cost of punishments, we get a form of criticality, and then robustness um, leads to these social quilts. And, and then the, the problem is that when you want to actually work with data, you need asymmetries. Right, so the world's not fully symmetric. Not all favors come in with exactly the same probabilities, the same values, the same costs. Not all in individuals have the same uh, perspective on the future. So you want all these things to be dependent on the relationships in question. You want them to be dependent on the graph in question and so forth. So you, know, you can do the same theory with, with all this heterogeneity, but you're not gonna get these nice pictures out in terms of exactly nicely symmetric um, structures. So what we find is the following. Let's say that a link between I and J is supported if there's a third party K which has a relationship with each of them. Okay? So this is different from the clustering measure, right? So we're just we're looking at a given relationship and saying that this is a supported relationship rather than looking at two relationships and asking whether it's closed. Okay? So the support relationship says I and J are related. Um, we want some common person who's essentially a witness to their relationship, K, who interacts with both of them. Okay. And what's the, the basic idea here? The basic idea here is if you want a, a, want a network to be robust and not to have problems with contagion, then if one of these people doesn't perform, somebody who's actually going to have to do the sanctioning is gonna to have to be somebody who knows both of these individuals. Because if they didn't know both of these individuals, if, if K wasn't known to J, then if this relationship here is broken, then that's gonna to have to have some consequences somewhere else. And in order to come back to haunt the person who, who didn't perform, the, the contagion's gonna to have to be larger. So what we're gonna be able to show is that even though we've got a lot of heterogeneity and so forth, you're still gonna to have to have on a, on a small scale this kind of structure is always going to have to be there. Okay. So the, 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 the heterogeneous case, what you can prove is that 
Um, as long as players can't sustain favor exchange completely in isolation as a pair, then the only way you're going to be sustaining equilibrium favor exchange and being robust is to have all links be supported. So we know that's a necessary condition. We don't know what all the networks look like, but we know in order to sustain things and not to have contagion, that every time you have a relationship, there has to be a, a, a third party in question having relationships to both of those individuals. Okay? Okay. So now the data. Um, so this is a project that I've been involved with, with um, Arun Chandra Sikhar, Abhijit Banerjee, and Estu Duflo. And what we've done is, is that we're actually looking at microfinance diffusion in southern India. So we have 75 different villages that we went into before a, a microfinance organization came in. We surveyed the villages and we asked them a series of questions about the social network structure. And in particular, we asked questions of the form, who do, who do you borrow kerosene and rice for if you, from if you need it? Who have you lent kerosene and rice to? Um, who, do you, who, you, who have you borrowed uh, more than 50 rupees from? Who have you lent? So we have a whole series of questions of this form. Um, so we have you know, some networks you could think of as favor networks, borrowing and lending money, borrowing and lending kerosene and rice. There's also more hedonic kinds of networks. Whose house have you visited? Uh, who do you call your friend? Who do you go to temple with? So we have a series of different relationships and sort of to blow one of these up, this is the borrowing and lending money relationship. So here, this is a village, uh, the average typical village here is about 900 uh, individuals. Um, these are, individuals are collected into households and based on the surveys then, we have links between uh, two given individuals if they've said that they've borrowed um, at least 50 rupees from a given individual before. So the nodes are individuals or households? So the, the, here in terms of the picture, I'm not sure how, what the resolution you can see is, but these, these, these things are groups of nodes. So the little teeny dots are nodes, are the actual individuals, and they're collected into the households they live in. And then we have you know, the relationships between these different individuals. Okay. So, so we have borrow, borrow and lending money. Here's the temple relationship is actually very sparse in this village. So this village, not many people go to temple. Um, uh, an advice network, who would you go to for advice? Um, kerosene, medical help, who do you go to for medical help? So we have 13 different networks in total in each village. And what we can do is begin by looking at, it, remember, this is what's coming out of the theory. It's saying in order to support favor exchange, what we should see is that any time two people are supporting, uh, exchanging favors, there should be a third party that is related to both of them. This was the relationship that comes out of Coleman's closure, which is saying, if I know two people, they should know each other. Okay? So what we can do is we can go into these networks, ask what fraction of links are actually supported, and what fraction of links of, of uh, pairs like this are, are closed in terms of the triads. Okay? So here's the, the first cut of the, of the data. So these are just the 75 villages, zero to one. Um, these are the measures of support in the different villages of the, the fraction of, of links that are supported. And these are the clustering coefficients for the villages. And I've broken things down by the top one here, the green one is exchange of favors, physical favors, uh, money, kerosene, rice. Um, these are friendships, the percentage of friendship links that are supported where friendship means I go into the, somebody's house, et cetera. And these are the clustering coefficients broken down by um, social and favor. And then you can put them all together and see what that one is as well. Okay. So, so we, we do see support is ranging from you know, 60 to 90%. Um, it's fairly high. It's, it's substantially higher than the clustering coefficients. Although those aren't really comparable. They're, they're different measures. So it, I guess you know, one thing is saying, and, and I, I think of this as not necessarily testing a theory or testing these things against each other, but what it is saying is the theory suggests we should see support, we see fairly high levels of it. Um, clustering is a different measure, and, and I guess one, me one thing that comes out of this is these are really capturing very different things in terms of, of their uh, 
the fractions that you see in the, in, in the data. Yeah, sure. Let me do that right here. So uh, I'll, I, I'm just going to give you the easiest version, and then in the we have like a 45-page appendix where we did. Mm -hmm. You can you can do it by you could predict what's the fraction of support you should see under an ergom model. So we've done an exponential random graph model where you put that in, and, and you can sort of you know measure by different characteristics what should be uh, a predicted level and so forth. What I'll do here is just compare it to a, a, a an, a very simple measure. So um, this is just uh, an inverse CDF. So now the villages are just, you know, again, you can think of the villages on, on this axis, but now ordered in terms of their support. So here is the, the fraction of links that are supported in the various villages, ranging from, yeah, just below 60% to somewhere about 85%. This is the hedonic support. Um, the, the relationships of friendship and so forth. And what you can do, one, one way to sort of figure out whether this is coming out at random or not, is to say, let's suppose we've got two, link, we've got two nodes, right? So one possibility is that the reason that we get this kind of relationship between two nodes is because there's just a high density of links. And so the chance that any two people have some friend in common is high just because it's a small village and we all know enough people that that's going to happen by chance. So what we can do is ask, okay, let's suppose that people aren't linked. If it was at random, whether or not this is here should be independent of whether those two individuals were linked or whether they were unlinked. Right? So what this does is say, okay, if they're unlinked, the actual fraction of unlinked people who have a friend in common is on the order of 10 to the, the max goes up to about 15%. Whereas the fraction of people who are, are linked to each other, the chance that they have a friend in common is much higher. Okay. So it does suggest that this isn't something that just comes up because of the small size of the villages and the randomness of the graph. And then you can do this by what we do in the appendix is you know, how proximate are these people geographically and so forth. And you know, with higher geographic proximity, you can get this number, this bottom number, to jump up a bit. You can't get it much above 40%, 45%, even if you throw in all the covariates that you can find in terms of the modes and the rest of the, the structure. So it appears that the, that support really is doing something. Um, you know, we compare different types of relationships. Uh, it's systematically higher. So in 70 out of the 75 villages, you see higher support levels for the favor relationships than these other more hedonic relationships. Um, let, me, let me, I should wrap it up. So let me just say a little bit about the, um, going back to this Medici uh, Florentine picture. And this is sort of an interesting, here the clustering was about 46%. The support is 88%. The interesting feature here is you can look at the business relationships and ask how many of them are supported, and then you can just ask of, of marriage relationships and how many of them are supported. It turns out that 100% of the business relationships are supported in this network. And that's the part, in, in fact, in, in many cases, if you look at the business relationships without the marriages, they're not always supported. So it's about 85% of them are not supported if you throw out the marriages, but then when you go and read back what Cosimo was writing, Cosimo was explicitly writing that they were putting in some, you know, they were arranging these marriages to complete these situations where they could make sure that they had some indirect tie to whoever they were doing a business relationship with to make sure that they had the indirect pressure. So there, you know, you, it's sort of explicitly engineered that you see this. But the, you know, this is a smaller network, but you're getting 100% of those relationships being supported, and they're being supported um, you know, explicitly in, in some cases by marriage relationships. Okay, so conclusions, uh, you know, you, you end up with these different variations in the game theory giving you some predictions about what's going to emerge, and the support measure is the, the identified measure, which differs from clustering. You see it in the data, um, and, you know, one thing that's there is favor, advice, and sort of business networks shows significantly, statistically significant, more support than these sort of hedonic measures uh, relationships. That doesn't mean that the hedonic, it could be very well when I call somebody my friend and say that they come to dinner, that I'm also doing favors for them and other kinds of things, so that there's reasons why both of these have very high support levels. 
but you're seeing high ones in the ones that we explicitly identify as relationships where there's transactions going on um, in these villages where there's not enforceable contracts. Um, you know, obviously, these networks and behaviors are intertwined. Uh, here, I guess, one of the main messages is that the social enforcement gives you particular insight into what the local patterns ought to look like. And, you know, robust enforcement um, ends up limiting what you can do, um, but giving you very specific kinds of social structures out. And, there, you know, there, obviously there's a lot of unanswered questions. Here we've bitten off one very particular, narrow-minded, very rationalistic view of, of exactly what the interactions look like, but it gives us some insights into what the network structure is, and, and that's the hope of the exercise. So I, I think I should stop uh, at this point. Questions. You didn't uh, say much it's a pretty broad geographical region of, of the New Testament there. Um, is there any yeah. dialects there? Right, so there's actually, uh, so these, all the villages are within 100 to 200 kilometers of Bangalore. They are uh, somewhat diverse, so that in terms of the, the structure of the villages, the smallest village is about 300 inhabitants, the largest is about 5,000. They are very, some of them are, are predominantly sericulture, other ones are close to Bangalore and actually have uh, some markets and other kinds of things that, that they run. Some are purely agricultural. There's a variety of different uh, aspects of the villages. And one thing we're doing right now is actually um, looking at different aspects of the villages and seeing how those correlate with, with some of the support measures. And, and so, so my question actually has to do with the hedonic results. So is there any chance that translation differences between the different dialects that you tested could Press yeah, we did do reverse translation on the on the questionnaires since there were we, we actually had to do five different versions of the of, of the right, questionnaires the and the teams. Right, friendship from one dialect to another. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Different. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and you didn't go through all your No, no, no. And part of the reason that we asked very specific questions about, for instance, borrowing and, and lending a certain amount of rupees or borrowing and lending rice and kerosene was to avoid that kind of issue. So there are some of the networks, which the one where we ask. In, in the friendship networks, we didn't ask who, we asked whose house have you visited, um, who would you go to f uh, for, for advice. So we asked kind questions that, that attempted to be more concrete. Uh, more concrete. But it, it, it's impossible to, you know, th these are apples and oranges in some ways, and, and there were some translation problems that we encountered in, in these villages, certainly. Uh, suppose that there is a certain probability that someone has absolute integrity. So you have some people who are known to have absolute integrity and don't need enforcement throughout the, the network. Uh, but I'm wondering, maybe you could get a much wider set of networks instead of just quilts uh, supporting cooperation. Yeah, I, that, yeah, I have a very good question. I, I haven't thought about that at all. So um, I don't know what the people who are connected to those individuals would look like, but, but, um, yeah, the other, the other, the other, but, uh, uh, yes, yes, but th that's a good question. It, it, it's certainly worth thinking about. Um, I, I thought that, yeah. The, uh, the fact that you can't make money from the network builds in a kind of trigger aspect to, uh, yes, to this all by itself. So that raises both some theoretical how the theory would change and whether in the empirical studies this seems to be a plausible Yes, yeah, so, so uh, two answers. One, on the theory side, the reason that we work with it this way is, is mainly for tractability um, in, the, in the sense that it's very difficult to, to deal with the question. If, if you can sort of rebuild links over time, then how fast you can rebuild them and so forth makes it a very complicated problem to analyze. So we did that mainly for the, to be able to solve the game. Um, in terms of the practice, what we've done is we're, we're actually resurveying the villages now. Uh, part of the difficulty is the resurveying, so the, the, a lot of these data were collected um, because the, a bank was going in and offering microfinance. So the, we know that in, in 45 out of 75 villages, microfinance has come in and the other 30 villages microfinance has not come in. And so what we're doing is actually trying to study the changes in the network structure over time 
and how those have differed in the villages where the microfinances come in, has that disrupted some of the social relationships as compared to the other ones. So, so we, we're actually resurveying right now um, to try and look at that. But uh, there's all kinds of measurement noise in the, in the data originally, so, so we're not sure how, what we'll be able to make of that. But it, seeing what, what new links are there, what ones have disappeared and so forth, um, we're going to try and make some use of that. Yes. Question, comments, any others? Yeah, one more. So I mean, it's interesting, at the end of the day, what you wind up with, the, the kind of mechanism is what's an, another term for that, uh, as we'll come to, is sort of edgewise shared partner mechanism, uh, or, or way of implementing. Um, and so there are lots of sort of paths that lead to that idea. So another path that leads to that idea is that you have some traditional story where formation is encouraged by shared partners. Um, and then you might assume, for instance, that there's some kind of diminishing returns in that. So the first shared partner is really critical, the second and the third. We haven't formed a tie by now, we're not going to. Um, and we know from the, um, the statistical literature on this that, that thinking about it that way, as opposed to say triangle formation, works a lot better. So um, it does seem to, to work well in that sense. Um, but the, the question is then, that raises a question, can we empirically and empirically separate out the kind of mechanism you're talking about, which is really a retention mechanism mm -hmm. um, from a sort of formation mechanism? Um, and I mean, one time slice obviously is difficult, but I would think that would be really the key test of your, um, you know, your hypothesis going forward. Um, and there, are, there is actually some work, so Pablo Kravitsky, for instance, been doing work on separable models, and Margaret, she's been involved in as well, where you model the, the formation and dissolution processes um, of uh, ties separately. And in some contexts, it's not clear to me that's the right way to do it, but um, although it's computation index. Nice. But this would be a context where that might make a lot of sense for game theoretic reasons, and that you actually here have a pretty strong argument for why the retention of a tie would be very different from the formation of a tie. You can imagine the formations could be quite idiosyncratic, but then the question is, when do we break it? And it's based on this shared partner effect. So if, that's, so if you're right, then what we should see is that retention is very heavily governed by shared partners. Mm -hmm. Shared partners are very protective of existing ties, but that they don't necessarily have a very powerful um, effect on formation. And if we yeah. see that, and that would be a pretty strong signature that this type of mechanism is what's going on, as opposed to just, we have more opportunities to form ties because we have these partners in common. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Yes, yes. excellent. Yeah. Time for one last comment, if someone wants to make a concluding comment. Yes, yeah, some of the work that I've done with colleagues in Thailand, we've collected networks um, that are somewhat similar. So we have help with the rice harvest, and we have a borrowing and lending of agriculture equipment and water plants and so on. It seems to me there are two things. One is that those are often asymmetric, so that there are people who have mm -hmm. water pumps and others who, who borrow. But there's also um, then a sense of the need for the equipment in the first place, so that it's we find variability across our 51 villages uh, related to, for example, the extent to which rice growing is an activity and therefore there is help going on. So you said that you could extend your models to account for different things like asymmetry or maybe different endowments that people might have. Could you say just a bit about that? Yeah, so, so the, the last part when we get out this sort of support uh, conclusion that, that works in worlds where there's going to be some asymmetry because even with an asymmetric kind of relationship in order to make sure that 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 we can enforce borrowing even if it's asymmetric in, in, in the the tendency over time or the ex, the magnitude over time uh, we'll need that third that that mutual friend in common so the um, that kind of of prediction is is fairly robust but the, the first part of things in terms of getting these nice quilts out is something that's going to disappear. And, and more generally, once you've got that kind of heterogeneity, it's, it's very difficult to make very precise predictions about what, the, what kinds of things are going to look like beyond the kind. That's why it's, we get sort of a minimalist um, prediction out. I guess we can take one more. Mark is uh, getting set up. We can take one more question or comment if anyone has one. Uh, yes? Uh, well, just following up on your question. The, if you had people able to form new links, but at a very, very slow pace, so that maybe your analysis of the loss of links would still go through, but then maybe people would systematically form new links uh, that would be supported links or something like that. So I'm just kind of conjecturing mm -hmm. that you may be able to get predictions about the formation of new links as well. <coughs> yeah. 